welcome to episode one of Writing Smart Contracts with Mutant and the Go Ethereum client. I'm Stefan Schulz, CCO for Ethereum, and I'm joined today by Jeffrey Wilkie. Jeffrey, you want to introduce yourself? Hey, man. Um, yeah, so my name is Jeff. Um, I am the core developer on the Go side. Uh, I joined Ethereum in December, although well, basically just started developing because I thought it was fun. I read the white paper, and now I'm a founder. That's me. Brilliant. Thank you. So... Uh, today, uh, we're going to learn about Ethereal. Can you tell us about what Ethereal is? Yeah, so um, um, Ethereal is a, um, is a client. It's written in QML. Uh, it's written on top of Go. Um, it serves as the main UE um, for the Go client. Um, it's still in its very early alpha, alpha stage. And um, it has a very basic and limited contract editor. Um, it has a basic debugger, and um, it can send and receive transactions. Very simple. Okay, so it's an Ethereum client, basically. Yep. So why why do we have two Ethereum clients? I, I heard of Aleph Zero, of course, which is the C++ implementation. What's the benefit of having two different implementations, maybe three if you include Python? Right. Um, so just, just imagine uh, kind of a, a, a complex problem. Um, you have you have the white paper, which is uh, which is a non technical white paper. Um, it's just uh, it's just an idea, mm -hmm. and the only thing um, if you if if you want to find problems in a white paper, if you want to if you want to find holes in it, you know you have to um, you have to start developing it. And um, so I just I basically started my own my own implementation in December and. Um, the C++ guy, Gavin, he, he, he did the same thing. Um, in, in January, somewhere, we, we started comparing our clients together and, and see whatever, you know. So I had my interpretation, he had his interpretation. Mm -hmm. and, and through that, we, we figured out what were the, uh, the holes in the white paper and how we could fix it. Um, and and that, is, that is one of the one of the advantages of having two implementations. The other one is... Um, understanding the white paper, understanding the protocol, and um, if either one of the, the implementations has a bug, there is still one or two other clients out there that that, that just function normally. Right. Okay. Uh, do they share the same uh, blockchain then? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So if so, uh, if I'm running whichever version of the C++ client, I, I'm actually uh, I can send you a transaction, and you're going to receive it through the Ethereal client then. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, it shouldn't it shouldn't be a problem. I mean, um, it, it's it's. Uh, I'm not saying it's easy, but you know, it's not very hard to have have two clients communicating with each other. Okay. Um, the only thing that you have to make absolutely sure is that they are, you know, they they they, they interpret the data that they receive exactly the same. So both of the clients have to do the exact same thing uh, because if they do not, it doesn't work. They'll go out of sync. Great, gotcha. Okay, so uh, on Aleph Zero, I heard that we wrote contracts in something called LLL, which is a Lisp-like language. Uh, what do we use on the Go client Ethereal? Um, so I, I, I started developing out my own implementation of a language that I thought was best. Um, we have Serpent, um, which kind of resembles uh, Python. Mm -hmm. and to be to be very honest with you, I don't like Python very much. Um, <laughs> I don't, um, you know, it, we, we don't play well with each other. <laughs> right, okay. Um, so, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I like C, I like C++, and I like Go. And what they all have in common is curly braces. And I just, you know, I just miss curly braces, and um, I just, you know, I just needed them. So I, I worked on my own implementation, very, very rough, simple implementation that uh, um, could, be, could be optimized. Okay, so basically, if I understand this correctly, uh, whether you're using LS0 or whether you're using Ethereal or whether you're using the Python implementation that Vitalik is working on of the Ethereum client, uh, you'll be able to use potentially any of those smart contract languages on top of each, right? Yeah, sure. So um, LL, um, um, Serpent, and Mutant, they all compile to a Assembler type language is a language which can be interpreted by the virtual machine that's run within Ethereum. Okay. 
So there's one virtual machine and uh, you have, uh, imagine, compilers that compile down from Mutant, down from Serpent, and down from LLL into what's called EVM code, right? Yeah, so it's, a, it's an assembler-like language. Uh, people familiar with, with, with assembler development um, know what I'm talking about. It's, uh, you know, it's, you, you can develop in it, but it's not very easy. Um, while higher level languages such as um, Serpent, Mutant, and LLL, you know, um, it's just much more friendlier to look at and um, much easier to develop, develop it. Okay, and what's this uh, intermediary bytecode I heard about? Um, so um, it's uh, exactly what it is. It's a, a bytecode. It is, it is storage efficient. It, it tries to um, um, limit the amount of bytes that you need mm -hmm. for each operation. For example, um, if you need to do, if, if you have an instruction, the first byte is, is a uh, is an instruction sequence, and it tells you what to do. It tells the virtual machine what to do. For example, um, storing a certain data in a storage address or store it somewhere in a contract, some, something along those lines. So, if I understand this correctly, I type my code in Mutant using my favorite text editor uh, or the ID that you've mentioned earlier straight into the Ethereal client. Uh, that converts down into EVM code, correct? Yeah. That's and right. then that goes into intermediary bytecode or not? Yeah. So, yes, it does. Uh, okay. And that's what the virtual machine actually runs when... Uh, exactly. Right. So, what, what it does, it, it, it takes the, the Mutant code it compiles it to an assembler type language and it takes the assembler type language into just translate it into bytecode and the bytecode is understandable by by the virtual machine that, that that is embedded in the in the python client the c++ client and the go client brilliant well i think i understand it wonderful um so uh, I'll, I'll uh, explain a little bit about the type of audience we're expecting today. I think we're, we're looking at, at developers, really, uh, that have experience writing in C-like languages. Uh, Go would be ideal, obviously. Uh, but I think somebody who knows Java, somebody who knows JavaScript might feel a little bit at home here, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's not a very difficult language to understand. It's just, it, it's, it's, it's statically typed, so you have... Um, Integers ranging from eight to two hundred fifty-six uh, to thirty-two bytes. Um, you know that, that's all you really need um, because the virtual machine uses two hundred fifty-six bits um, storage addresses and, and integers. Um, so it's it's technically typed in that regard. You, you only have integers, and it's the only thing you really need. Um, and but besides that, it's not very hard. It's just you know, if you want to define a variable, you define what kind of type it is, and you know, just, just have an identifier for that type, and you can reference it later, whatever you want. It's very easy. It's, it's like JavaScript or Go. Okay, great. Well, let's get started then. Uh, on my machine, I'm using uh, OSX uh, Mavericks. I have uh, a terminal open, and that's all I have. Um, I have Go installed, so for those who don't have Go installed, there's a link that's flashing on the screen right now, pointing at the instructions on to how to install Go on OS X. Uh, Jeffrey, correct me if I'm wrong, but pretty much it's the same process on all platforms, right? If you can run Go, you can run all this stuff, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's slightly harder on Windows, um, because we, we use Qt, and mm -hmm. um, I, I, I haven't done a lot of development in, in Windows, but as far as I know, it's not very friendly, to say the least. Gotcha. Okay. Well, Mac OS X it is for today, and then we'll issue uh, probably some links on, on how to install all this. I think they already exist. Uh, isn't That's what you're showing us right now, right? Um, you're so building yeah, Qt for OS X. Yeah, these are the build instructions for OS X on Linux. Um, um, this is for building Qt because that is one of the uh, one of the requirements that, that that it has. Because it uses QML, you need Qt. Um, so these are the instructions that you have to do first before even you know grabbing the, the Ethereum client. Gotcha. All right. So I don't have that stuff installed. Do you want to do it together, or should I go build my own and come back? Yeah, you you you, you go on, go ahead and build. Um, just you know, just try to follow along with your instructions. If we if it doesn't work, we figure it out. Because you know, unfortunately, I have everything installed already, so it's kind of pointless for me. Okay. Uh, well, uh, we'll see you at the next episode then, and uh, speak soon.